But there's one more development, this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus. But instead, Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now. but. Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. And this time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. Today we will finish up our series called Holy. I am excited for what this will do in our hearts and in our lives. As we start, I want us to think about what is it that motivates us? What motivates you to get up in the morning? What motivates you to work hard at work? What motivates you to invest time and energy in the people that you care about? What motivates you to do what you do? Now, back when I was a wrestling coach, that's pretty much what a coach does. They motivate athletes to do what they really don't want to do, to be clear. They motivate them to do what they don't want to do so that they can be who they want to be. So, what is it that motivates you? I had a wrestling coach that had a sick sense of humor. And his way to motivate us was to say, hey guys, you're doing good, but if you work really hard for the next half hour, We'll knock off early and we'll go play dodgeball. Oh yeah, and everybody gets excited and they start wrestling like they've never wrestled before. And at the end of that half hour, he said, you guys have been dogging me the whole first half of practice. So back to work, no dodgeball for you. No soup for you, okay. He was a bit of a wrestling Nazi, but this is the point. We were losing motivation and how did he motivate us? With the promise of something fun, right? So we thought, oh, it'd be great to play dodgeball. We love to do that even though we're trying to be wrestlers. Think about it, okay. But in wrestling, that's how you, you, you find what motivates and you motivate. Now, for me, that's not mostly what I do now. Mostly, when I'm coaching, a lot of it is with marriage. But the same things that, that are true of a wrestling coach are true of, of a pastor trying to coach couples as they get married. You ask questions like this, how do you see yourself? I mean, as a wrestler, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a, you know, a sectional champ? Do you see yourself as you know, the best in your weight class? Do you, you know, what do you see for yourself? What is your experience? If you're losing all your matches, that may be a bad thing to see for yourself, but still, what is your experience? What is your focus? What are your expectations? That's what you would talk to a wrestler about, but it's also what you talk to a married couple about. What do you see? As you look at your marriage, as you look at your life together, what do you see? What are your expectations? What is your focus? Where are you? Where do you want to be? It's also true of us as we follow Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, what do we know about the Corinthian church? Were they like the most spiritual, holiest people in all the New Testament church? No, they were the people going sideways. They were the people doing all kinds of things to pollute their life and to pollute the church and to just 
mess things up. When we talk about, you know, you need to embrace the mess, you need to walk into the mess, for Paul, that was the church in Corinth. And this is what he says in chapter 7. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Wish I had time to talk about that, but there's more than one way to defile yourself. <coughs> there's more than one way to undermine your holiness in life. Cleanse yourself from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So what Paul is talking to them about is not salvation. This is far more than salvation. In salvation, in Christ, we are holy, which is what allows us to be in the presence of God, which is what allows the Spirit of God to dwell us, dwell in us. But there's more to it than that. There is a process of becoming holy. In English, the word is sanctification. Sanctu comes from the Latin, but in the Greek, this is all the same word. Holy means to sanctify. So when we say sanctification, we're really saying holification, which is why we say sanctification, because that was hard to say. Okay. <laughs> but we, we have work to do in becoming the holy people of God that he has called us to be. So how do we see ourselves? What is our experience in our holiness? I mean, right now in this room, there are some people that feel very close to God in this moment, in this season of time right now. And there's some that feel kind of close to God. And there's some that feel like God is 100 miles away. And that may not have anything to do with how spiritual you are or how holy you are. It's just this season of your life. In the end, God wants us to be drawn to him and our lives transformed to be more like him. What did we say it meant to be holy? It's to be unique. It's to be different. It's to be set apart for God and his purposes. So holy isn't just like holier than thou. Holy is actually we are a person that's becoming more like Jesus every day. Now, your message notes will be the last half of the message. I just threw this part up front. So if you want to take notes on what we say in the next few minutes, just take them at the bottom, which is totally backwards. It's just the way it turned out. Okay. <laughs> There is one way that we walk in holiness, but there are many reasons why we're motivated to be holy. And that's what I want to talk about. Is, is Paul is saying here to the Corinthians, cleanse yourselves. Does that sound like work to you? Does that sound like intentional effort? Does that sound like something you're going to be motivated, you're going to need to be motivated to do? Well, the reality is we all have different compelling whys. The, things, the, the why behind we do what we do. And what I'm going to share here for the next few minutes is something I think that is true for a lot of people at Vista, but different people would have different primary motivations. The first one is this. We want to deepen our connection with God. Okay, when in Christ we have a connection with God, but the point is it doesn't deepen by itself. It's actually, it takes our participation in the process for that relationship to deepen and become what it should be. Hebrews 20, 12, 14 says, Strive for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Like I said, right now, some of us feel like God's very close. Some of us feel like God's, he's there, but, you know, it's kind of a middle ground thing. And then some of us feel like, man, God just seems very far away right now. Well, you want to see the Lord? You want to deepen in your relationship with the Lord? Without holiness, it'll never happen. What we have to ask ourselves is, is our desire, is our motivation for holiness relationship-based? Is it intimacy-based? Or is it performance-based? Is it behavior-based? Holiness, to be what we're talking about in Scripture, is all about relationship. It is a desire for intimacy with God. If it's like, well, I just want to be a holy person so I can impress God and he'll be glad he has me on his team, that is totally upside down backwards and not going to work well. Think about this. What difference does it make if growing up you feared your father, but you had no connection with him? Let's bump it up a little bit. You respected your father, but you still kind of came in second when it came to his time and his energy and his attention. 
You loved your father. You had a connection with your father where, man, you guys were just on the same page. You could talk about just about anything. Now, those three kinds of people, are they different? Do they end up different adults? <coughs> Sometimes they're in the same family. They are siblings. They had the same dad, and yet their lifetime relationship with their father is very different. Now, we're supposed to strive for holiness in the fear of the Lord, but that word for fear means respect. But you can still respect somebody that you don't spend any time with. That still falls way short. You want to respect your dad, but you want to have a connection with your dad. You want a love relationship. And some of you are going, it didn't happen. He's gone now. It's never going to happen. Okay, if this is true of your heavenly father, it is infinitely more true, excuse me, of your earthly father, it is infinitely more true of your heavenly father. We are all sitting here today as the result of the kind of relationship we settled for with God. Is it enough just to be scared of him? No, that's not what fear of the Lord means. It means we have an awesome respect. He is the source of holiness, and the metaphor we had a couple weeks back was of the sun. And the closer you get to the sun, as pure and holy as the sun is or as unique as it is in our universe, you get too close to it, you get fried. Our God is good, but he is so good that we can't approach him without Jesus. So why would we be motivated to, to give ourselves to growing in our holiness and perfecting holiness? As it says here, completion of our holiness. What would motivate us? Well, what kind of relationship do you want with your Heavenly Father? Do you want to deepen that connection? Second, there's a bunch of us here. We just want to be blessed. We want what happens when you hang out with God. Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. They experience God in their life. They see God at work. That's why we tell real stories, because we're seeing God at work. We talked about this when we did the Sermon on the Mount years ago, but when we're blessed by God, that just means God gives us himself. The blessing is not the fun stuff. The blessing is God himself. But we want to be blessed in God. Hebrews 11.6, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. I think it's NIV says earnestly seek him, but still seek him. So for some of us, we're motivated. We want to deepen our connection. For others, we want to walk in the blessing of God. And then for some of us, we just want to do good. To us, the, 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 the pinnacle of, of a spiritual life is the life of somebody who does good. And yet, what kind of sideways idea do we have of holiness? We think holiness is all about performance, not relationship. We think holiness is all about not doing anything. Don't do anything because it might be wrong. So it's all about denial. It's all about you know, withdrawal. It's not about denial. It's about blessing. It's not about pulling back. It's about doing amazing things. How many of us do, us, do, do of us think that being holy means you stop using your brain? You stop being creative. You stop being artistic. The opposite is true. A person who is flourishing in God actually is more creative and more artistic and does more, not less. So for some of us, we just want to do good. Titus 2.14, one of my favorite verses. Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify or make holy for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for what? Doing good. In, when I did the message before the service with the Sunday school teachers, one of them had an elementary age child that was sitting in with her. And so she raises her hand, which I thought was hysterical. but Just like class, raises her hand. And she said, so what you're saying is we don't do good to have a relationship with God. We do good because we have a relationship with God. And I'm going, yes, if a 12-year-old can get it, so can we. So charge forward. May this never be said of us. This is a verse that I have to read because it has the word stupid in it. And I just think, I just like to say that word, and now I can say it because it's in the Bible. 
But may this verse never apply to us. This is written about God's people from the prophet Jeremiah, and it is heartbreaking. Listen to what he says. For my people are foolish. They know me not. How often is that true? We try to live our lives for, in some way, shape, or form so that God will be okay with it, but yet we don't try to know him. For my people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. Wasn't that fun to say? Let's all say that together. No, no, let's don't. Okay. <laughs> they have no understanding. Why don't they have understanding? It's because they have no relationship. They are wise, and he puts that in quotes, in doing evil, but how to do good, they know not. How sad is that? We are to be the people, because of our relationship with God, that good is just what we do. And then finally, most of us at Vista, we want to be free from all the craziness in life, and we want to be somewhat sane. As Isaiah said uh, two weeks ago when we, when we uh, did the second part of this message, he said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. It's like, I am half crazy, and I live with a bunch of crazies, and that's a great description of the world that we live in. But this is what Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, and if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And then couple that with what he says in Matthew, no one can serve two masters. Why not? Because it makes you crazy. You will either hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't do both. So as we pursue God in holiness, we're not trying to run after all these other things that are just making us double-minded. And James says it would make us unstable in all that we do. So why give ourselves, why be motivated to holiness, to deepen our connection with God, to be blessed by God, to do good, and to be free and sane? So now we can pray and get started. Week three, we're going to talk about the flow our motivations are all different. One of those probably means more to you than the rest. That's great because we all are drawn to God for our reason. But how this works is the same for all of us, and that's where we want to land the plane here. Let's, let's pray. Lord God, I pray right now that this would be a very practical and tangible study in your word to see how you work in our lives, how it works to be a person of holiness. Lord, there are a lot of weird ideas that we pick up over time of what it means to be holy, but what it means in your word to be holy is that we are fully and completely given to you, and as a result of that, we flourish. And because of our flourishing, there is fruit in our life that flows out into the world around us, and the nations are drawn to you. So, Lord God, help us to see what we need to see, that we would be motivated to live our lives for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about the flow. This is everything for the next 10 minutes here in one statement. Holiness flows from the presence of God for our flourishing into fruitfulness for all people. As much as we would think our holiness is all about us and our relationship with God, there is a purpose far greater than us. As Rick Warren would say, it's not about you. This is about us flourishing, and the fruit of that flourishing is what will bring the nations to God. So let's start with the first phrase. Holiness flows from the presence of God. In the story of Ezekiel, the, the vision starts out, and it's just the temple, and out of one of the gates of the temple is this little trickle of water. And that you know trickling, tickling of water as it runs out onto the ground begins to flow to the east. To where the Dead Sea is. If you look at a map, Jerusalem is pretty much straight north of where the Jordan River, or excuse me, straight wet west of where, the, of where the Jordan flows into the Dead Sea. So this river is going to flow straight uh, from west to east, and it's going to tap into the Dead Sea. Now, 
it starts out as a little stream, and then it gets ankle deep, and then it gets knee deep, and then it gets waist deep, and then it gets to where you can swim in it, and then it gets so wide and so deep that you can't even cross it. And so by the time it gets to the Dead Sea, it's this massive river. And as this water flows into the Dead Sea, what happens to the Dead Sea? It comes to life. All except for the salt flats. The very southern tip of the Dead Sea, it's, it's very marshy and shallow. And that's where these salt columns to this day form in the, in the flats. But, but that's still there. And I can't tell if that's saying, but there's some people that will never get this. That could be what that means. Or it could just mean, no, we need that salt. So God's not going to make this so fresh that you still don't have a supply for salt. I don't know, but the salt flats are still there. This is what I, uh, Ezekiel says in verse 12. And on the banks on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, from the temple. And, and literally, the sanctuary probably is a reference to the holy of holies. It is the holy place. Sanctu, like sanct, uh, sanctification, means the holy place, the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. So where does holiness flow from? It flows from the presence of God. When God is there, holiness comes from him. We don't get our act together and get holy and go to him. No, as we approach him in Jesus and our sins are forgiven and we are put into a righteous state, a right state before God because of Jesus... Now, his presence is free to flow in our life. And, and, as, and as we become holy, it's not because of what we're doing. It's because of what he's doing. We just have to let him do it. We have to not get in the way. The flow comes from God to our hearts. Second, holiness flows for our flourishing. God doesn't want us to become holy so we're just like totally dull and boring and we're, you know, black, brown, and gray, and, you know, just are the dullest people on the planet. No, his, his holiness flows into our life, so we become everything we were created to be. Psalm 92, 13. They, it's talking about the righteous, about the people of God, are planted in the house of the Lord, and they flourish in the courts of God. So that is the Old Testament picture. As you are in God, you are in the temple, you are worshiping him, and you're flourishing because of your connection with God. Now in this vision, that presence of God now is flowing in this river, and everybody that comes in contact with the river gets the, the benefit of the flourishing. Isaiah 44, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass, among the nations, like willows by flowing streams. So God's people, as they connect with the flow of his holiness, flourish in him and now become obviously different than the rest of the people on the planet. So holiness flows Thirdly, into fruitfulness. God wants us to flourish, but he wants to do something with that fruit. Now, here's a short list of the fruit that comes from living in God's holiness. I would also point you to Galatians, um, the fruit of the Spirit in 5, 20, 22, right in there. The bottom line is there, there's all kinds of fruit of the Spirit, but this is what it's going to mention here justice and righteousness and peace and quietness. Anybody here have a young baby at home? Quietness. This, this is a good one. This is a good one. Quietness, trust, and security. Isaiah 32, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness, or again, the nations become a fruitful field and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. So you go from wilderness to now a fruitful field, but then in time it grows and matures more until now it's a forest. So it's the, the picture of full prosperity. 
Then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness abide in the fruitful field. And the effect of righteousness will be peace. And the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. When Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, you know, it's like my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wants us to experience what it means to flourish in him, in God. And finally, the fruit is not just for us, it's for all people. Now, that's clear in the Isaiah text I just read, but let me read another text from Joel, which is it isn't just about Gentiles and Jews, it's about young and old, male and female. Joel 2, 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, shall speak for God. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. God wants people across this globe, from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, Male, female, young, old. You're never too old. You're never too young. He wants us to flourish in him. And he wants the fruit of that flourishing to then be the evangelistic message that will draw others in as well. So we all have many compelling whys. What is it that actually would motivate us to live a life holy before God? and to grow in that holiness and allow that holiness to perfect in our lives. Many reasons why we would, but there's only one way that it actually works. And that's what we just said. Holiness flows from the presence of God for our flourishing into fruitfulness for all people. But this is the kicker, the surprise ending, the thing you didn't see coming. Where is this flowing from? In the vision, where does this flow from? It flows from the temple. Who is the temple? We are. Now, for sure, this flows from the presence of God in the temple. If God withdrew his spirit from the temple, it wouldn't be about the temple. It would be about wherever God just went. But it's as the spirit of God manifests itself in the temple, that this process of holiness flows from the temple. But who's the temple? We are the temple. Now, if what we say in the next few minutes doesn't put a weight of responsibility on your shoulders, you're probably not listening to what I'm saying. The weight of this is massive, but the reality of it it is what it is. This is the way God has designed. This is a gospel message. This is how it all goes forth. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Do you not know? And he's saying this because some of them were confused. Do you not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The manifest presence of God is in you. But that is not you singular. That is you plural. That's why Jesus says, if two or three... So if you want to be with a total of two, how many other people do you need? One. Simple math. So if what Jesus is saying, if you can find one other person who wants to pursue God, who has a heart for God, and you and one other person... As a youth pastor, if, if I could only give one thing to the kids in my youth group, it was one friend who was following Jesus. If I could help them find one friend that they could go to the same high school, they could go through class together, they could eat lunch together, they could share life together on their high school campus. If they had one friend, I knew that's all it took. Now, two friends would be better, three friends would be better, but one is profoundly different than none. This is a huge call for us to live in community. To not just come to church, sit in a chair, enjoy what's happening, be encouraged in your life, and then get up and never connect with anybody around you. That would be bad. Because the temple 
is when you're connected with at least one other believer. And then the Spirit of God manifests itself in your relationship. And that's what changes everything. That's where the water flows. So, where we started. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a part of the temple of God that needs to connect with the rest of the temple so that the presence of God would be manifest in your life, that your life would, be, would flourish, and then the fruit of that would change the world around you? What is your experience? What is your focus? When you get up in the morning, is it, okay, God, what are we going to do today? And who is that person that I connect with? Who is that community group? You know, who are those people that I connect with? Who are the other people in my life that are my spiritual family? And as we do life together this week, this day, what are you going to do? What is your focus? What is your expectation? On the last day of the great feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts... Now, talk about a rough segue. Nobody was talking about what Jesus is getting ready to talk about. He just stood up and blurted this out. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of of living water. Is that our expectation? Is that our focus? That God wants to use us as a conduit for his presence in people's lives. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord God, we love you today. And I will be the first to confess it's easy to get comfortable with where we are. And not expect more, not focus on more. Not see ourselves as growing and maturing and becoming the people you want us to be. It's easier just to kind of do church and, and do life and, and mow the grass and clean the house and go to work and eventually clean the garage. <laughs> Lord God. You have called us to be your holy people. The flow of your spirit, of your presence in the world, it flows through believers all over the planet, but here and now, it needs to flow through us. Lord God, may we see ourselves differently because of your word. May we understand that you love us and you want to have an intimate relationship with us. You want us to see you as a father that we can talk with all the time and go to with our deepest concerns. You are the one that will give us wisdom. You are the one that will create a path for us to flourish. Lord God, pour your spirit out in this place. May we flourish in you and may the fruit of that flourishing change Southeast Orlando and the world. Amen.